Namaste, good afternoon. On behalf of the Mothers International School and every seeker who has joined the session today, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Alok Pandey to the fourth session in the series of interactive talks on the virtual platform. Alok Bhai's talks have always been a source of light and delight for us. Interspersed with Shorobindo's and the mother's words, anecdotes and stories from the Gita and the Puranas, his own life experiences and incidents, his talks are ever so engaging and impacting. In the present unusual times, all of us as individuals, parents and teachers experience moments of overwhelming emotions and reactions, be it anger or agitation, sadness or pessimism. Sessions such as these act as catalysts to restore calm and peace, hope and acceptance in our being and behavior. They seem to tell us that the path may be rough, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. But the challenge that arises is how to sustain the state of being, how to maintain a state of peaceful acceptance. This is what we are going to know and understand today. Welcoming you again, Alok Bhai, over to you. Namaste. The challenge of finding peace, hope, light, calm, beauty, harmony, bliss, and their source in truth and delight, and then sustaining them. There is a question that uh, actually comes even before it, and this question is, does man really want them? There is a story of Bullisha when he was not yet Bullisha, the mystic, but a seeker on the path. And he wanted to know about God. He wanted to discover God. And he was told that there is a master who tills the fields and he can give you, he can tell you what God is or where he is. So Bullisha wants to go and meet the master. But uh, as you know, we know he came from a royal lineage of none else but Prophet Muhammad himself. All his family members told him that, you know, how can you do it? It's disgraceful. How can you go and, uh, you know, ask for knowledge when you belong to the lineage of Prophet Muhammad, so who for them is knowledge incarnate? And of course, Bulesha knew that knowledge is not passed through heredity. It is not passed by believing in a particular religion. It's not passed by simply conforming to a belief system. It has to be sought. And knowing this, he set himself upon a journey, broke all the conventions of the family and went all the way to meet this person who was tilling the soils, the master. And he asked him that, tell me how to find God. He didn't answer. He was busy tilling the soil. He was busy plucking something, the weeds out and putting something there. Again he asked, repeated the question. So again he kept quiet a third time and the master said, Don't you see it? Don't you see it? See what? Don't you see what I am doing? If you are attentive, you will know it. So he didn't know what is the master doing? What kind of asana is this tilling and keeping? What kind of pranayama is this? What kind of meditation? He has never learned this technique. So he says, what are you doing, master? I can't see it. He says, that is the difference. I am plucking it from here and putting it there. That's all that you have to do. In Punjabi, he said, Athe chug, athe rak. So what we are doing is, all our attention, as the Gita puts it, is focused on the outward world, rushing through the senses. Sri Aurobindo describes it in Savitri, like, you know, the postman knocks at every door and we rush to know what has come from where it has come. So through the senses, our life is streaming outside. Our consciousness is constantly streaming outside. What is outside? We think hope is there. 
somebody will come through the door and bring for us a gift and parcel of peace of light <laughs> perhaps he does but momentarily but after a while the surfaces of a of life tire us and there's the time we want to retire into something deeper we want to discover something truer and beautiful so the secret is turn it from here this field and put it there what we have to put the same faculty attention awareness concentration consciousness call it whatever and all the techniques are meant to do that take the mind from this field where there is turbulence and put it there where we will find it otherwise we'll be just you know uh, changing environment changing situations but we'll be caught up in the same old story i had a patient like that who came after you know long time depression and he was a big man md of some big pharma company and he had uh, been advised by Uh, someone that you change your you know take a break you know people they want to take a break take a break from work and retreat into some hill station or some place and there you will feel at peace then come back so he was going through depression he took a break rich man so he went to one of the best places where he could one of those clubs uh, in some you know hill resort and he went there so two days everything was fine the third day he started feeling again the restlessness and depression and then she came to me after few days is there also i had the same problem so i asked him what was the problem he said usually i started getting depressed i said but just try to find out what created the depression in you he said the same problem as in my factory i was uh, you know all the time competing with somebody or the other wanting to be on the top i said so what happened there he said unfortunately i just played a tennis game and i lost so now he took it that you know he's a loser and he must win so he played another game and he lost as things would have it so he once again went into the same mode which was the cause of his misery as long as we think that the cause of our misery is outside us we cannot change anything well we can try to change we can change places we can change work places we can change houses we can change people we can change environment but the cause lies within us this is the first sutra that we have to understand what is meant by the cause lies within us to start with before we go into the deeper aspects of the cause there are within us two zones two entities almost and we have fed one and undernourished the other as the great legend says that a boy saw two wolves fighting in his dream one was a dark wolf and one was a bright wolf i don't want to use the word black and white because that's very racist and most wolves are gray we move in gray zones but nevertheless he saw it in the morning he asked his father dad i have seen this So what does it mean? He says they are fighting. That's what it means. So who is going to win? Whoever you feed. So what do we do? We feed within us discontent. We feed within us unhappiness. We feed within us revolt. We feed within us the tendency to complain, grudge. We invite forces of disorder and disharmony. And then when we go through. pain and suffering as an inevitable consequence then we have one mister to be blamed and that is god poor fellow he can't give back his side of the story <laughs> so for everything good we take the credit for everything that goes wrong in the life there is one mister god but wisdom tells us just the reverse you see when swami vivekananda was asked about how great how mighty how wonderful he is you know somebody who could pick up a topic and speak for hours days that kind of uh, you know it is said that um, he picked up zero and he continued a series of lectures on zero so they asked you are so wonderful he said no 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 all the credit that you see in me belong comes from my master shri ramakrishna all is his all belongs to him then what comes from you he says all the problems <laughs> wherever you see a mistake know that it has come from me and wherever you see a glory shining it comes from the master 
it's a very illustrative legion it's a story real story it's not it's not just that he was being falsely humble or modest swami vivekananda was not that he was being real and true swami vivekananda the narendra the little personality with its own littleness like everyone else adds to be we now we can translate it to us we have a little self within us a little self which is made up of an ego identity which is temporary and temporal it is a construct of nature i am born in a certain circumstance certain environment a surname a religion a belief system a degree a, a mr so and so a who's who and what not this is the zone of turbulence why because it's very narrow you see water when it passes through a narrow gorge what happens it creates eddies it becomes turbulent it's the very nature of things it is just an instrumental personality but when we start living in that zone life will be miserable there will be always eddies and currents there will be storms and cyclones so the mother said very beautifully in one of her conversations with huta says my child you must know when cyclones come to open the door and step inside the room where there is peace so where is the key this is the key is with you see life can be so beautiful and simple when we read mother and shirvind i don't know people have made them also very complicated by talking about you know all integral philosophy and you know uh, all kinds of uh, talks on super mind and nothing short of that we don't even want to you know <laughs> so human mind is a penchant for turning things into great complexities even the simplest of things what is the message of the mother what is one of the fundamental things that she teaches us and compare it with you know philosophies where we are taught a technique and we have to you know practice it two and a half hours three hours meditation every day withdraw from this leave that what does she tell us divine is everywhere the first fundamental sutra who oh, is it yes he is everywhere he is with you just hold this sutra and live life life will be wonderful second why don't we find him because we don't care to find him is it yes my child she would say we don't care really if we look at our whole day 24 hours how often do we really seek the divine and how much time is spent on self will my life my things what happened and our mind is it is caught even when we pass through things which are beautiful and wonderful we are unable to enjoy them sometimes i use this as a method when somebody comes who is depressed and walks into the office so i just ask the person that what did you encounter on the way now in uh, delhi it was wonderful because between my office was located in a place uh, cme where you know there was nice subrata park where there was a nice uh, walkway and you can't reach there without going through a nice road with some trees so i would ask them what did you see on the way so it's a awkward question the person is keen to talk about the depression no no tell me what did you see on the way now you know and uh, they don't know so they are non plussed so then i asked did you notice the tree this is there were trees did you notice the flowers on the trees now you know nobody has noticed the flowers on the trees <laughs> why didn't you notice the flowers in the trees because you are caught up with something so small and sometimes the reverse method people who would come in bangalore because the road was so crowded so i had a simple method of putting some nice little things outside the room and music playing sunil das music so many time people would come and say oh you know while we waiting for you we felt so much better we already have a lifted depression so this is a simple practical way of revealing that see you were you came you were not well and by the way this is an advice for hospitals for institution where people have to wait i don't know why we have all kinds of things token number coming flashing this is simple thing which can be implemented even in banks it can be implemented people would like to wait so the the moment the attention shifts then things change see it is just a question of shifting the attention now very often very unfortunately it needs outer means to shift the attention so we are told go to a hill station go to a retreat why does it help it has because for a moment our attention shifts but as i said the root is not treated so when the root is not treated when we come back the problem comes back because the root remains 
So what is the root which leads to this kind of turbulence, loss of peace, calm? Peace and calm and light and everything is all the time there with this, with us. All around us. Shobindu says there is an ocean of light and peace right above our heads, right behind us. We may use the word divine presence because it is a presence, it is a being. Or we may say that there is a state of consciousness. If we are too secular minded, if we don't, uh, if our ego gets too snubbed by thinking there is a divine being out there, though that is our own secret reality. Nevertheless, it's all around. In the Vedas, it's described as Diti, who is surrounded by Aditi. But the choice we have to make, we may choose to live in this state. And then, whatever we may do, we may go here, there, ultimately we will say, of oh, better than this life is death. Or some people will make a gospel out of suffering and want to escape into nirvana. But one can escape into nirvana any time while being in the world. One can withdraw into this zone. What is needed? Very simple thing. We have to change the values. Now, if we look at, there are two kinds of things in life. One are things which are very temporary and transient. And their value is not in themselves, but in what kind of a force uses them. It's not that they are valueless. That will be a mistake to think. Everything in creation has its own value. The little grain of sand right outside the, as we step out of the door, has its own value. See, out of sand, people can make lovely art. But what value we give to these things is where we must be careful. If we think that these temporary transient things have their value in their own right, and we invest, or just because I hold it and I possess it, then we lose the real sense. Nothing is meant for our egoistic enjoyment, but everything is there as an instrument for use. Use by whom? By something deeper within us. So the first practice, as the mother tells us, is to learn to step back and see what is of lasting value. What is going to really endure? Two human beings, they form a relationship. What is important? Is it the human being or the love that is blossoming in between? When we give importance only to the human being and not to that power of love which is blossoming, then we miss the point. If we give importance only to the instrument of knowledge and not to knowledge itself, then we miss the point. We think the end of knowledge is the end of the book. When we give importance to an object through which we have derived pleasure and joy, then we miss the point. Because there is a self-existent joy which one can find anywhere and everywhere. Have we not seen so many times that when we are in a certain state of consciousness, then even the simplest of things gives joy? And on the other hand, when we are not in a good state of consciousness and somebody brings, you know, uh, you are unhappy and somebody makes a nice uh, nibupani with lot of love and care and asks you to take it with all love and care. And what is the state? Grumpy? No, I don't want it. But at another moment, that plain water comes from someone. You know, there is a very nice... Interesting Zen story, somebody was going on a trip journey and the person asked his guru for an advice. So guru said very simple, eat when you are hungry, sleep when you are sleepy, <laughs> drink when you are thirsty. Yeah, of course I know it. What is the great deal about it? But when we look at our life, we see that what it means. So he traveled, he said, I have to listen to my guru's advice, whatever it be. So he would not eat till he was hungry. When he was hungry, the first food that he received, he loved it, relished it. We all have this experience, isn't it? To follow the inner rhythms of nature. And then he walked till he really felt sleepy. So when he felt sleepy, whatever little slab was there, he slept so cozily and comfortably because he was sleepy. And then when he was thirsty, whatever drink he could get, he didn't say that, you know, I have to jump across some mountain cliff into some parasailing boat and pick up the whatever sprite or something out and say with a victorious thud. <laughs> what kind of advertisement are we teaching, you know? <laughs> Sorry for the aside, but like, you know, is it worth, if you look at the field of advertisement, you'll wonder, is a bottle of Coca-Cola worth your life? <laughs> and people do it. So what we are trying to really see the power of projecting certain ideas. 
and through that we capture the mind of the race. Why is it that when people, I am just taking a little aside, you see when before all these soft drinks came into market, when people came to homes, what was served to them as drink? Chach, Matha, Dahi Kalassi, Nibupani, right? At the most, sometime later, Ruavza had come. And we felt it so nice, not even fridge. Now you give Coca-Cola and people are wondering, Coca -Cola. I don't take Coke. What do you take? I take Fanta. So, you know, <laughs> pro problem has come up. See, this is a problem of a kind of extreme materialistic view of life, utilitarian. Everything has been spoiled. Taste has been spoiled. Minds have been spoiled. So, what is our idea of finding happiness and peace? Let's do party. Let's go outside. Let's, you know, go to a hotel. So sometimes I found it very childish when people say, oh, we are enjoying life. Little do we realize that life is enjoying you. You are not enjoying life. Life is enjoying you. You come home, you have indigestion, your energies are sapped. So whatever that force which is around in such places, that is feeding on your vital. Very often people go to such places and come back and fall sick. And what does the mother advise? She says, people's idea of entertainment and relaxation is so foolish. Entertainment and relaxation means rush out. Go to some big place. Now, you know, sorry, Christmas is coming around the corner. First, December, first January, see, it's so beautiful. Birthdays. How does the mother, see, she has brought in this dimension into life. First January, 31st December, world over, people will rush out, drink, drive. This is the idea of celebration. And celebration of what? The new year is coming. What a way to greet and she does just the reverse. Earlier it used to be midnight meditation. Then later on morning 6, you wake up with that music of Sunil Da, where she would give a message that the new year is going to come. And she would, in prophetic words, reveal what we should be. A kind of resolve. It's a time when we can shed off the past. So it's a whole attitude towards life that must change. Instead, we want to learn a technique. Technique to find peace. All right. You'll find peace. Why? Because you'll spend 10,000 rupees, you better find peace. Because when you buy things, you know, when you buy something expensive, what happens? You have bought from a designer shop and you come and tell somebody and the person says, Oh, this I have got Saroj Nagar market, 500 rupees. How much you spend? 4,000. 4,000 you have been cheated. Now your joy is gone. You are happy about the brand. It's not that the thing has a value in itself. But because it is so expensive, <laughs> you, oh, it is so expensive. But actually the value is not in that. Ultimately, let's say you have footwear. What is important is the comfort level. It is not, that's it. If you have a comfort, comfortable footwear, it's fine. If you wear a cloth which is comfortable to you, it's fine. If you have food which is tasty enough for you and healthy, it's fine. But this whole idea is, to go out, go out and find something. So as long as this is our value system, we will never be really able to sustain these things. This inner pursuit going within is not a difficult process because divine is everywhere. This is the first sutra. So why don't we experience him? Because now you see one example I'll take. Go into nature. Everything is so wonderful. Go alone into nature. You love it. Go with a good friend, very good friend. Take a walk, wonderful. Go with three people. Now you see what happens. There will be some discussion. There will be some debate, some dispute, some disharmony. Go with a group of ten people. You will only have food, no nature. Everybody is with his own nature. <laughs> so what is the problem? You know, I often wondered what is the problem. And then there is a line in Savitri which says, In man is somewhat, something dim, disturbing lives. The problem is not in human beings, by the way. The problem is in the mind of man. It imprisons us. It doesn't allow us to release. Why does nature give us that joy? Because for a moment we step out of ourselves into a vastness. Just look at the sky, we don't need anything. What happens? We are suddenly, we enter into a vast state. That vastness is within us. Within us are the Eldoredos. Within us are the islands of blessed. Within us is Kailash. 
Within us is Vaikuntha. Within us is Brahmalok. Everything. This is the ancient saying. But we, we have been taught, unfortunately, in an extreme materialistic society, which denies everything that is within, everything that is subjective, everything which is, uh, you know, even deemed spiritual. And what is true is only what you can touch, sense, hear and in spite of knowing that this is a fallacy still. So the result is that we are looking for it outside. And when we look for it outside, we get it temporarily because we have paid a price for it. As I said, learn a technique and for some days you will feel good. Why? Because you have done a course and you like to say it. You know, I did a 10 day course. But you are the same old monkey. Nothing changes. You may go to a course or anything because the root of the problem is inside. Nobody teaches us in the technique what is really working. Say vipassana, how does it work? Or mindful meditation. So much talk about it. Why does it work? Because your attention is taken away from all this. What is taught in mindful meditation? You are taught focus on the breath. Of course, breath has a connection also with our, you know, parasympathetic nervous system and all. But all this will help us temporarily. Our mind is taken away from certain things and for a moment we are as if there is an unlocking otherwise the mind is always in that zone of worry so after some time if we practice it the breath itself stops i mean it goes on subtly and we enter into a zone which is other than this little thing in which we are caught so many techniques so many ways but these don't endure the problem is in how to make them last techniques will tell us and everyday people do it for some time they are fine, again they are back to life. So the technique lies in the real technique is in change of attitude and that comes when we change our values. So we come back to the same question, what do we really value? And we can roughly say there are things of a transient nature, temporary nature and they have their value but not an ultimate value. And things of a lasting, permanent nature, they have an enduring value because they, once we acquire them, they are going to last. And these things will come and go away. When you know, we hear so much about karmic law and all that. And um, when Shubhendu was asked about all these things, he has, he has written a lot. So let's not make one letter as the uh, last word. But at one place he says so beautifully that blows come to all human beings. They don't come only to you, but they come to all human beings. Why do they come? He says it is the lesson of life. That when we are attached to transient things, temporary things, they will be snatched away or there will be fear of them being taken away and therefore we will always feel insecure. And this insecurity will lead to fear, anxieties, worries and everything else. So it means a change of attitude. First we must value and to value we must have faith that there is something called as lasting peace. There is something called as eternal. There is something called as true. There is something called as bliss, something called as love, grace, all with a capital L. And these are things of lasting value. And when we shift our value, shift our attention, then life begins to change wonderfully. And the second is, it's not enough just to value it for a moment, but this should be always in the backdrop of life. How to do it? Very beautifully, the Gita gives us a whole path. With regard to outer things, Sri very beautifully says in one of the letters, the life of the world, sansara, is a field of unrest. Enter into it, it's a zone of unrest. Why? Because it's a chaos of vibrations. As I said, the mind of man, imagine three persons. You need three people to form a political party. Because one will descend from the other two and you will have a party. Now imagine a cacophony of... We don't even realize it. Thousands of people, each with his own ego, looking for their own self-interest and in a city which is built around desires, walk into that zone and one will be infected. And an infection which is much worse than Corona. Corona infects the body. Unfortunately, it has infected the mind also of man. But these desires, they infect us so deep it's like, a, it's, it's like the root of many diseases. As she puts it so beautifully, desires irritate the organs. Ambitions sometimes are the greed. It is behind tumors. So we don't realize that, you know, how they are affecting us. Because it's subtle, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So what we have to do is, we have to be daily 
learn this value and as far as outer life to practice equanimity. This is what the Gita tells us. Practice equanimity. Be indifferent towards these things. Very good. Go through everything. So what is it towards which our attention should be? The Gita beautifully says, remember and offer. Do everything but do it for the Lord. Don't do it for others. Don't do it for yourself. Very beautifully, I read a message today. I mean, it's a well-known message, but again, you know, these are very good reminders. For those who want to serve truth, here is the advice. And she says, you are not here to please yourself. Okay. You are not here to please others. You are here to please the Lord. Now when we look at it like, like that, life becomes beautiful, simple, straight and easy. But then human mind has brought in crookedness. And that's why the labor is long and the whole path to align our will with the divine will. And it's a whole journey. I am not speaking of that right now. But suffice it to say that if we really value the eternal presence within us, divine presence within us, and turn our attention, it doesn't even need that we have to sit, you know, bolt straight for three hours, four hours. Divine doesn't want that. Few minutes. See, very beautifully, there's a talk, I, I, I think it was Navjaji's half an hour with the divine. I think it is based on something which mother has said. All that we need is time to time. To look towards him, our eternal friend, our lover, our beloved, our father, mother, child. And just say, hey, you are there. You don't have to, you know, use big words, Sanskrit slokas. All right. All that is needed is to say, hey, you are there. There is a story of little Jim, the carpenter who had a broken bone and was admitted in hospital with his one leg up the ladder sling. But whenever people came to see and hardly anybody came to visit him. But he was always happy. So people next to him said, how come you are able to remain happy? We are so miserable. One day somebody doesn't come. Our loved one, we are unhappy. Some, something happens, we are unhappy. He said, no, no, that's very simple. What is so simple? He said, you know, every day I had to go for work. I am a busy man. I can't go to church. But I used to see the church and I used to cross it and simply used to say, Hey Jesus, this is Jim. <laughs> so, fine. I didn't know. But now when I am in hospital every day, this man who is inside the church steps out and comes and says, Hey Jim, this is Jesus. <laughs> there is a very nice line in Ram Charit Manas. Ek ghadi ya do ghadi aadho me puniyad tulsi sangati sadhu ki hare koti aparad. The value of satsang, the right kind of company. The mother says, watch over the company you keep. We may be in a beautiful state and we meet a human being who is, you know, full of all these miseries of life. It is enough to sap the energy and infect the poison inside. I am not saying that we start avoiding and shunning people out of fear. No, but just be vigilant. Be careful about the company. There are people whom we have to meet in the course of work. Practice equanimity. But those who will be friends, be very careful. Because when we start this inner life, the true life, the beautiful life, the blissful life, for a long time it takes it to be rooted deep. Once you are a wit, whatever actually it doesn't matter. But when one is still growing in this inner life, it's very important to be careful about the company we keep. That is the reason why people went into monasteries, ashrams, so that at least there are people who are there with a similar aim. They may have different natures which is bound to be there, but at least they have a similar aim. And that is good enough to hold them together in that space. So meet people in the beginning, Shovindo says, when the psychic being is developing, it seeks the company of God seekers and God lovers. The Gita even advises, don't meet uh, with people who are hostile to me. Why? Everybody has divine. This is the most, you know, the, the best way to destroy spirituality, to take its beauty, take a truth out of context and generalize it. For example, Hinduism is a way of life. So everything is Hinduism, whatever you may do. That is the bane through which you know it got, got destroyed. It's a way of life, but qualified. It's a way of life based on dharma and truth. If you don't put that qualifier, you are just... Otherwise, anything and everything is a way of life. Similarly, God is in everyone. Yes. 
but in some he is more manifest in some he is far behind covered in many wraps are you really capable of piercing all those wraps and see the divine presence if yes then of course you are through but if not then be careful of the people with whom we meet where we go the places we visit the company we keep because it's going to spoil a whole days and sometime months of effort the mother says in one of her talks people have lost so much that they gained just because of friendship they had a friend who dragged them to the abysses and that's why he says you should be so careful about the company we keep about the places we go so to sum it up there are three stages of evolution one when we value only the outer indulgently the outer and we think we are going to find joy peace calm there well go ahead i had a long discussion with somebody on this issue and he continued you know sometimes we want to resist so i said okay go ahead fine suit yourself as this you know it is <laughs> you'll discover it's not there you can't go to a vegetable market and look for the original authentic diamond even asking for diamond they will laugh and if you find by chance a jeweler shop who is asking you for 200 rupees and give you the best diamond in the world obviously he is fooling you so that's not where it is found god is not found in the marketplace bazaar of human life where people are meeting out of commercial interest and money and all that certainly not he is there he is definitely there but he is covered behind the wraps and one day we have to bring him there but that's the latest stage this is the stage 1 when we are caught up we are looking for the right thing in the wrong place too bad we won't find it then the next step is we turn away from the wrong place and turn to the right place it's a place when we go through a narrow gorge when we keep the world outside beautifully in savitri in moments when the inner lamps are lit and lives cherished guests are left outside our spirit sits alone and speaks to the gulf so we must snatch out moments of quietude and silence don't wait for that mythical one hour it may not come but many many minutes can come see it's like you have to fill a pot and you are waiting for the tap to turn fully sometimes it happens no now things have changed but you know the water is coming like a trickle so what do you do one is you wait when that stream will come fully it may come it may not come second is you put your matki bund bund se ghad varta hai after one hour it will be full we have all have had bath and experience like that no so any moment as he says throughout the day there are many windows that open into the infinite a moment's peace a moment's silence quietude when it's a gift of grace but we that is the time we lose we rush into company we rush into the phone we rush into 100 things that is the time to just be quiet and withdraw inside this is the second stage find such moments plenty and if you really look at it those 2 minutes 3 minutes 2 minutes 3 minutes driving it's a wonderful opportunity you will see that in the day you will end up really accumulating a lot of inner wealth those drop 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 whereas you are waiting for 2 hours it doesn't come and you say what to do i am very busy person you can't be so busy that even while taking a bath you are busy you can't think of god you are busy because you have a mental idea that after doing all this i'll sit in padmasana and you know remember him remember whenever you can what is there taking a walk you can remember driving you can remember there's so many opportunities remember 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 and offer so this is the second stage when we are going through that narrow gorge and we are leaving slowly we are leaving this zone we don't want to do much with it we are doing just maintaining a relationship because it's necessary for the framework of life but practicing equanimity focusing on that which is eternal and true and lasting and beautiful and the third stage which is there in shurbindu's yoga the old yogas will end here we draw into that quietude find more and more time eventually post retirement plan is well the narrowest road to nirvana but in shurvindo's yoga after we have done it we come back into life and now we are rooted so deeply in that peace in that infinity that wherever we go and whatever we touch it is not we who go and touch but the divine who touches all things through us and whatever the divine touches there is peace there is harmony there is beauty there is light there is love this calm and tranquility and freedom and joy 
so these are the three stages depending upon where we are we must know what is what it's all right if you want to remain in outer life and believe that somehow by some magic something will happen my so called person next to me will give me the peace and joy fair enough my bank balance will one day post retirement will satisfy me and be the my security sure enough try it world has tried millions have tried none found it so we can still another person who can try try it or we may believe that by this position when i retire at reaching that high people are so afraid they continue to work because they are afraid now that is not finding really anything worthwhile but it's okay it keeps us preoccupied monkeys are happy when they are preoccupied now that's a different story fair enough to each his own but if we really want to things to of lasting value and make it last we have to give it value because in the end of the day we will find only that which we value value the divine value the divine presence who is the source of peace and light and beauty and harmony and bliss and we'll see that he will invade our life from every corner from every bough he will call in the morning the bird that you missed will bring the message and the song of hope the water running from the tap will make you feel happy it will be music to the ears even the clangor and clang of the tools hammer and tongs normally an expression used for something else will be some kind of a music like you know music of the battle cry even when you are in the crowd and the noise you will see that suddenly you enter a zone of silence and inner peace but we must value it if you value it the divine will be there he is there to lift us out of this state he doesn't want us to suffer karma or no karma he wants us to be happy he wants us to be peaceful he wants us to be in a state of beatitude he wants us to be full of knowledge of power of strength and everything but we need to value it so let us hope that we change our values with change of values comes change of attitudes then we begin to find time what we thought there is no time <laughs> and then when we come back to the world we have opened the doors of infinity upon this finite creature that presently we call ourselves thank you namaste uh thank you uh, alok bhai कस्तूरी कुंडली बसे मृग ढूंढे बन माही ऐसी घटी घटी राम है इन साइट विच यू हैव गिवन आस दैट इट इज ऑल विद इन आस एंड वी हैव टू लुक फॉर इट वन क्वेश्चन इज हाउ कैन वी यू सेट दैट यू नो वी वी नीड टू ब्रिंग अ चेंज इन द एटीट्यूड हाउ डू वी ब्रिंग दैट एटीट्यूड इन चेंज हाउ डू वी मेक दैट शिफ्ट फ्रॉम द यू नो प्रेजेंट एटीट्यूड टू अ चेंज yes 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 uh so how do we bring a change in this attitude and change of values i have hinted it but i would emphasize it again and it can never be over emphasized be careful of the company if we are in the company of those serials which fill our mind with all kinds of horrors if we are in the company of people who are full of doubts if you are in the company of books which in the name of you know oh, it's okay it's cool to read every anything and everything all right read ayn rand feel very fulfilled all of us at one stage felt like that till you know that she herself died of depression so you know it's all right if we want to do that but we have a limited time we need to understand we don't have unlimited time with us as human beings and i think this is a bane and a boon see when we read about satyug we read about people living for 10000 years cool at you know <laughs> it's amazing how they i don't know how they lived and what they did given 10000 years they should have supramentalized the whole creation whatever it is 10000 years so in dwapara it was you know then treta again you know uh, maybe a thousand year then in dwapara few hundred years and kaliyug if you touch 100 you celebrate a centenary but the 
एडवांटेज ऑफ दैट इज बिकॉज इट्स ए कंप्रेस टाइम इट इंटेंसिफाइज द कॉन्शियसनेस वी लिव एज इफ यू नो अंडर द शेडो ऑफ डेथ एंड सो देर इज इन अस इन कलयुग ए हिसनिंग ए स्पीडनिंग एज ए से दैट वी आर वेन वी आर कन्फ्रंटेड विद दैट सीनेरियो दैट वी हैव वेरी लिटिल टाइम it's very unfortunate that we don't realize it because we are waiting for some you know retirement but if you really look at it so frightening 40 years 50 years 60 years is just gone and what have we found whatever we found was something which is going to go away death is going to shatter it take away whole thing of falsehood we have accumulated around ourselves so it's important to understand that we have very little time and be careful of the company we keep because well unless as i said one has become a what vraksh people are very suggestible we get easily influenced right now you think that everything is we think we read mother and shobindo and very nice meet a person who is who will bring a different counter view and you know who is living too much in the mind who has no real experience and well all this can be easily that's that's all stupidity but in case you have not yet opened the doors of the true knowledge then ha ah, yes he bhi to sahi keh raha hai sahi nahi keh raha hai is not saying truth but you are unable to catch it so be careful of the company we keep that's why satsang is important when our flame is small it is good to be in the company of those in whom the fire is raging when a flame is small if you go into the company of massive cyclonic winds and storms there are people who are filled with desires like cyclones what will happen that little flame also will get extinguished again you have to light it you can't light it with the matchstick because you know it is so much wind so when the flame is small be in the company of fire when you are a fire then everything is different so that is the one advice and one of the simplest ways of keeping good company is simply through books of mother and shobindo through books of wisdom through the geeta spend time on that how much time we waste on all kinds of things books people discussions spend time on that it should be like a fire you know that you want to, and and i say this that you know if one can even make a target that in my lifetime i have to read mother and shobindo's books that's good enough for me it was like a discovery 23 24 when i first time i had shubh in those books in the next 6 years 7 years everything was read even sitting in the bathroom i just couldn't help it walking on the road like now you have whatsapp or staying in a sitting in train all the time we want to finish then next what do i read now next okay nolni da collected works all their life so it is something which is so wonderful it creates a whole zone within us it's the best company that we can keep so the only thing that i would stress is satsang 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 that changes attitude because otherwise very difficult we are constantly thrust in a zone full of negativity all around otherwise and other thing than that is find moments when we can withdraw inside quiet in the surface storm still another thing if we can't do that then just call the name of god ma 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 very simple call the name of mother even this is people find difficult if you ask uh, so simple as acha how many times did they oh today i forgot what is this I, i mean i just can't understand what is so difficult about calling a name but it is there so read savitri read her prayers spend time in just remembering the divine and life will be full of joy and felicity you don't even have to bother about attitude he will just feel us <laughs> nothing is needed if we turn to the divine we can bypass attitude and everything else because he is the source and another way to cultivate attitude is look at things just a little bit rationally all this that i am so attached to is going to be taken away look at nachiketa he could see it, a child of 9 year old probably because he was a child of 9 year old his father couldn't see it that look all these things are going to go away it doesn't require a book of philosophy to show us that all these things to which we are so cling to is going to go away but unfortunate part is that even when they are taken away people still go back to the same old story this is the misfortune so to change the attitude we have to just look at life with open eyes and we'll see the things that i crave for cling to 
things are indispensable, how many things are really indispensable? In fact, the answer is nothing. There is only one thing which is indispensable, it is the divine. Yes, any other question, Jayanti Di? I was trying to get Simran ma'am for the vote of thanks, but she is not able to join as a presenter. So she has sent me the message. So I would just re like to read it out that on behalf of the MIS family, I, Simran ma'am, would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for this very engaging session. The simplicity with which you convey such profound concepts interspersed with interesting anecdotes makes each one of us look forward to your sessions. Thank you for sparing your valuable time and sharing your deep insights with us. You have reminded us of what is to be truly valued for a content. We should be grateful for all our blessings. Such a simple mantra, eat when hungry, sleep when sleepy, drink when thirsty can make our, make our lives so blissful. We sincerely hope that we are able to imbibe your guidance and tread towards a more conscious living all the world with the new year coming in. Thank you so much for these constant reminders. Wish thank you, Jayanti Didi. We are a family, so no need to thank the family still. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bhaiya. Thank you. Namaskar.